Okay, <clears throat> welcome to this briefing uh, video on our final year project, NEC 4841A and B. Um, this is a, a pre-briefing session I normally run each year uh, or each semester, so students have an idea about what's to come with their final year project. Um, for those who haven't come across me, I'm Professor Bill McBride, um, and I'm sure I'll see more of you as the course progresses. So the first question is, what is the FYP? And, and you go to almost any university that teaches engineering and mention FYP and everybody knows what you're talking about. And so the final year project is this common concept across all of engineering programs in Australia, if not the world. Um, and it's what we call a capstone project. It, it finishes off the program, draws um, knowledge from all of the courses that you've done to date um, and, and allows you to apply that to a real problem, basically be it research, be it an engineering project, a whole diverse range of things. So how much work is it? And that's a really tricky one. Um, so if we think of it that it's 30 units worth of work, um, but it, that's, don't, don't get lured into a false sense that it's 10 plus 20. That's what the system says, um, but it's really just a 30 unit project that takes 12 months or, or two semesters. Um, to complete. The, the 10 plus 20 is just a, a thing that our system can't deal with having 30 units over two semesters. If you look at the normal um, way we allocate hours to courses, then 10 units is between 120 and 140. And on top of that, the, um, the 20 units for part B, you're talking 360 to 420 hours. Um, because I like simple numbers, I, I will often talk about 150 and 450 hours. Uh, of, of real work and you know there's often times in your project where you'll, you'll walk around the backyard scratching your head for half a day trying to solve a problem well is that really real work you know it's, it's sometimes that's hard to allocate um, but it's substantial is, is probably the most important part of that um, some projects you might do far more than 450 hours if you're doing robot x uh, or formula sae or some of those large team projects, you might put in considerably more hours than, than the nominal 450. I guess importantly, if you only put in 200 hours, then don't be surprised if you've got to come back the following year and try again. Seminars for this course normally run some weeks, um, and it's only in part A. Uh, for a number of different reasons, I've managed to um, pull this course down to about six sessions, six seminars, all about giving you information uh, to help you do your project. So when should I start? <clears throat> and as soon as possible is probably the best piece of advice I can give. Um, now I will stress over and over and over again, you know, it's your final year project, not the project you take when you're in second year or in third year or you've still got 18 months to go. It's your final year project. The idea is you pull all of this material together um, from all of the other coursework you have done. Put that to one side, the final year project is the only course in the degree that you can progress 100% independently of lectures. I'm not giving you anything in the lectures that um, enables you to go further in your project in any real extent. Um, so there's nothing to stop you starting pretty much today on your final year project. There is a caveat, you can't start your project in year three um, and then two years later hand it in. You know, it's got to be representative of a year's work in that sense. That said, there's no compulsion for you to start before week one of semester. Um, if you want to wait until week one and then start your project, that, that's absolutely fine. You might have reasons to do that, completely your call. Um, but if you're spending a, a significant period of a semester recess um, with not much to do, it's a really, really great opportunity to get in and get a head start. Um, the academics, the professional staff at the university are on campus um, for at least 51 weeks of the year. Um, so there's nothing really stopping you getting started on your project. The part A and part B are back to back. Um, 
enrolment into Part A or into Part B, sorry, is relying on that enrolment from Part A. Um, so you, you can't just enrol in Part B you know, a year after you did Part A. Uh, you can't have a break and expect to come back into it. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Who owns the project? And, and this is a really critical one to get into your head. Um, it's your project. It might be that it's come from an idea I've put forward or one of the other academics has put forward, um, but it is your project. It is for you to demonstrate that you can independently manage and drive a project. So if you do not drive the project, if you stand there and wait for us to, to leave you by the nose through the project, expect to fail. About, about that hard. Um, now, historically, our failure rate is fairly low, five or ten percent. All right, so that's you know, if you've got forty people doing FYPB, four of them are going to fail. All high. Um, there's probably a lot that fail, that withdraw to not get a fail. So I'm only counting those that actually fail. And then I looked at the data from 2018, semester two, part A, enrolled 45. 29 in S1, Part B completed 22. All right, so that's less than half who started their project in 18 S2, completed it in S1 um, 2019. So that's a pretty nasty attrition rate, and, and I'm hoping it's an outlier, to be honest. Um, but you know, you really do need to grab your project and run with it. Good piece of life advice. All right, you don't plan, it's not my problem. Resources. Um, the university has a wealth of resources, and most of these become available to you um, as part of your final year project. You need time on a scanning electron microscope. Yep, we can do that, not a problem. Um, there's some processes to go through to get the time, but we can do that. Um, you need a 100 frame, 100,000 frame per second high speed camera. Yep, got one of them on the shelf. Um, so we, we've got a whole heap of things that you probably don't know we've got. So don't just go, oh, I'd really like one of those, but I don't think we've got one, so I won't ask. Um, because you'd probably be surprised what we do have rather than what we don't. One of the biggest resources you've got access to is our staff, all of them, professional staff, technical staff, administrative staff, um, collectively there's an awful lot of years worth of experience. Um, ask around. So you might want to ask your mates some questions. You might then want to confirm it with some of the academics or some of the professional staff. Um, if you don't get the, if you don't get a, a sensible answer, maybe you need to ask a second person. Right? Not everybody knows everything. So uh, ask, triangulate, and then work out where you need to go. Um, we have, of course, a mechanical engineering tradesmen workshop. And they construct many, many items for final year projects. But if you want to get stuff built, and, and we, we offer, we're one of the few universities that do quite so much design and build. This is one of the things that a number of us are passionate about. Um, but there are processes you need to follow. It's not a free for all. You don't just walk in and ask for a job. There is a structured program or pathway you need to follow to get a job done through the workshop. And all of this is outlined in the final year project handbook, which is available for everybody. This is the other important thing. Um, you know, things take time. It takes time to schedule it in, it takes time to procure material, it takes time to manufacture. So don't, don't come to us a week before the end of your project and go, oh, can you make this for me? It's not gonna happen. Um, Co-linked with that last slide, a sense of entitlement is a serious affliction. You know, yes, you're doing a final year project. That doesn't entitle you to monopolize workshop stuff. It doesn't entitle you to monopolize resources. You know? um, we will do everything we can to, to enable your project, um, but just because you haven't planned doesn't mean we have to drop everything to help you through it. So keep that very, very firmly in mind. Timing is a really important one, and by that I mean you cannot afford to be idle. 
if you think that part A is 120 hours worth of work, 10 hours a week, ballpark, if you're doing it everything in, in the semester weeks, which I don't advise, you've got much more time available to you than that. Do you miss one one week? Because I've got other assignments due, um, the football's on, whatever. Um, then that's another 10 hours you've got to pick up next week or smear across a number of weeks to try and pick up. Um, what's 10 hours in reality? Well, it's probably a day and a half. By the time you get interrupted with other things, um, so now all of a sudden I've got to find three days next week to catch up for the day and a half I didn't do last week. So you really do need to be quite regimented and make sure you're doing work. This also means you need to multi-thread your project. Um, think about what elements of the project can I keep doing if one gets stopped. So if I need something made in the workshop, and I know that's going to take me a number of weeks once I let go of the project, I'll give it to somebody else to make, you need to have something else you're working on. You can't afford to be out of it. A tool I introduced a couple of years ago, and, and, and I'm not precious on the exact tool, um, Harvest is one of them, um, but there are several other free, and I emphasize free, you shouldn't be paying for this, time tracking tools that you can predefine, you know, it might be design, it might be research, it might be a whole heap of different things, categories that weekly or daily or whatever, you can go in and attribute hours to, to help you keep track of what you're spending on the project. This is a really good skill for, for a great number of you who are going out into industry. Your boss is going to want to charge you out. Um, and so they're going to want to know how many hours did you spend on that project or doing this part of that project. So getting ingrained in using something like this is really important. Um, the students that have used this religiously swear by it. I think it's the best thing ever. So I think that using Harvest or whatever time tracker works for you, I don't, I'm not precious about which one it is, although I do require an output of it in the final year project report. I need evidence of how many hours you put into it. Um, but because there's so few deadlines, is that there's a part A conference, a part B conference, and two final reports. Part A, part B. So there's not something due every three weeks. Yeah? So having that harvest thing ticking over in the background to help reminding you, actually I didn't do as much as I should have last week, it's really important. So again, it comes down to your project and your planning is imperative. So it's not our job to micromanage your project. Um, absolutely our job is to mentor you. You, know, you should be looking to meet with your supervisor be it weekly, fortnightly, and that's a number you work out with your supervisor. Um, and you know, you might meet weekly but not talk very much about your project. Simply touch base for 10 minutes. Right? And that might be all your project needs. Um, your supervisor is there to, if you like, grease the rails. You know, gee, Bill, I'm having a lot of trouble getting traction doing this. Hang on, I'll just ring somebody. There you go, solve it. Right? That's the sort of stuff we can help you with. It might also be that you've lost your way. <clears throat> I don't quite know where I'm going with this. Well, here's the direction. Okay? But it's not up to us to say, look, you haven't spent enough hours last week, you really need to lift the game. The grading of final year projects. So we've got two presentations, one oral, one poster. Um, and there are two reports, I already mentioned these. Um, the, the, all of your marks come from that final part B report. That is the, the, the element that endures, stays on somebody's shelf, that reflects everything you did in that project. The two oral presentations help you gain skills in oral presentations in different ways, one oral, one poster. Um, <clears throat> it also helps us better understand your report. So we read the report, and I've said down the bottom end of that slide, the report needs to read well and stand on its own feet. So I need to be able to read the report and understand the work you have done, understand the hours that you've poured into this and the sensible decisions you've come to in part of that, or that part of the project. The presentations help us understand that, give us a bit more clarity. So they may not get direct marks, but they help influence your final mark. 
policy says two people read your report, may or may not be your supervisor. So just because you've got a great relationship with your supervisor or a really terrible relationship with your supervisor, doesn't matter, there's gonna be two people. Um, you or the supervisor can request, no, I don't want that person to be marked by this person. Um, but as long as the marks come in within a, a specified boundary, the two marks are averaged, and that's the final grade. So it raises the question, um, does a particular type of project get a better grade than another? And the answer is really no, it doesn't. Um, you know, a, a, a purely blue sky theoretical project can get absolutely a top notch mark, as can an absolute um, industry based project, as can a very applied formula SAE robotics. So it's not specifically about the project. Some projects will give you a better mark in terms of um, what you can achieve in them. So certain types of students get better grades than others and because they can engage with a particular type of project. I can write a project that will require you um, to have a really, really in-depth and high level of understanding to even commence the project. So if you pick a project like that, you're never gonna get it off the starting blocks. Conversely, I might be able to write a project that is really tailored towards um, a student with, a, with a, an aspirational goal of 60, right? And, and it's hard for someone who is a, a normal HD student to really pull that up to a HD. Both extremes, few and far between, but they do exist. So it's not a particular type of project that would give you a particular grade, it's about what you do. It's all about what you do. If you're proactive, you grab the project, you run, you interact, you talk, and you really push the boundaries, you're gonna get a great grade. So the project types, um, and there's three main project types that I've listed here. Um, once upon a time, I used to be able to get a list of projects from uh, academics, and I still try, um, but we've, we've got quite a lot of load, all of us, um, and it's hard to get the project titles. So in this presentation is a list of what projects particular people, particular staff look after, and that's an opportunity for you to look at that and find a project, that, a project type that works for you. Right? You might be looking for a, um, not necessarily looking for a particular supervisor, though most students will probably go, oh, gee, I, I really like Phil, I'll go and talk to Phil. Or I really like what um, Alejandro does, I'll go and talk to Alejandro. Right? Um, but it should be about the type of project you want. And, and sitting down and, go, and thinking about this before you approach any academic. What are my goals? What do I really want to know? Or what do I want to learn? What do I really hate? You know, and that's probably an easier one. If you really hate design projects, open-ended, you know, then, then probably Formula SA may not be the one for you. Open-ended design teams, you know. Um, oftentimes we don't know what we really like until we do them, by the way. Um, you might really hate fluid mechanics. So, okay, you're probably not gonna to wanna to pick a fluids project. You're probably not gonna go and talk to Liza about a fluids project. So you can start to hone it down a little bit. And then if you go and talk to the academic and say, here's what I'm really keen on doing. Here's what I'm really good at doing. Here's what I'm really bad at doing. Um, and importantly, here's the sort of grade I want and the sort of student I am. I'll probably be able to build a project. So three types of projects, academic projects. Um, these are the ones that we've written generally around our research interests. Uh, may not be, might be just a project to, to give you guys something to work upon. Um, often the descriptions of these is fairly short um, compared to what I will ask you for something out of an industry project. But laid within that's normally a lot more thought that you don't see if we think about what black holes you might fall into. Industry projects. They can come from industry. Um, usually the student in mind, we get a number of industry projects each year, either direct from industry that I advertise, or because you are working in industry and you talk to your bosses and say, what can I do for this? Um, 
I've got in red there, take care. And there's, there's a few warning words that come to mind. Um, you know, as soon as you hear things like, um, the rig will be ready, or we promise we will invest, um, particularly if it's you know, six digits. Okay, just, just be mindful of that. Uh, because sometimes, you know, things like coronavirus hits and all of a sudden business says, actually, we don't have that money to spend and you've committed eight months of your 12-month project to it, and it's very hard to find an exit strategy. The final one is, and, and I'm always open to student projects, if, if you come to me with a, a really, really good project description, and this might be two or three pages long, it tells me what you want to do, why, you're going to, why you want to do it, how you're going to do it, what the resources are you need to do it. You know, um, I'm happy to consider those, or and it doesn't need to be me, any academic. If you find an academic who is happy with what you have proposed and willing to supervise it, great, not a problem. Um, but you just want to make sure that you don't either understate or overstate. Um, by understate, I mean you, you start in February, you finish by June. Gee, what do you do for the rest of the time? You know, it's unlikely to be. Um, Smacking the good if you got through it that fast. The other end of that spectrum is um, you, you scope a project is so enormously huge you can only tackle a little tiny morsel of it. So just keep that in mind. What do I pick? Okay, you're going to invest a lot of time. Select it wisely. Um, if I use round numbers, 450 hours is virtually unobtainable in my life at this point in time. Um, you know, finding what is effectively 12 weeks of full-time employment where I can work on nothing but one project doesn't exist. So you're going to spend an awful lot of time working on this. It makes sense to A, make it something that you're interested in. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing. If you wake up each morning and go, oh, you know, I should do my project, you know, you're not going to win goals. If, if you have to set an alarm clock at midnight to tell yourself to go to bed, to stop working on your project, and then you're up at six o'clock the next morning busting to get back to your project, that's the sort of project you want to do because you will do it so easily. Uh, you won't, the hours will disappear into it, you'll come up with a great outcome. Um, and there will be no angst. So think about a project that's going to stretch you. It's pointless if it doesn't stretch you a little bit. Um, something that you think you're going to get involved, in, interested in. Right? I'm not saying you pick your, your current hobby, um, but you don't want to pick something that you absolutely hate. Um, and if you do those things, the marks will flow from it. You don't pick a project by going, oh, that project there looks like I'll get a HD. Any project, or almost any project, will get you a HD if you've got the passion for it. Follow on from that is the project should provide enough scope for you to really show what you're capable of and not demonstrate what you're incapable of. So that goes back to if you, if you pick a project that's insurmountably difficult, but you can never even start it, all it proves to us is, is your lack of capacity. Um, Conversely, pick a really, really straightforward project. You might do it brilliantly, but it still makes it hard to give you a HD. So talk with your supervisors is, is the real key with that. Here we have a list of current staff and, and um, areas of interest that they have. So freeze, pause the screen, have a look at it. Think through what particular project types you might be interested in. Go and have a talk to those people. Okay. Um, yeah, not much more to say on that one. I've added here the marking guide that you use for finding your project B. This is my marking guide. It's not the only one you use, but it's the one I created and prefer. It's just to give you an idea about what you're trying to, to deal with. Um, so you can see we've got um, volume of work, depth of engagement, engineering approach. If when I read a report, I tick basic, basic, and basic, then your mark is going to be pretty basic. 
if I'm ticking exceptional, 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 then it's going to be an exceptional mark, right? Nowhere on that sheet does it say, is it a design and build? Is it a theoretical research? Is it an industry project? No, it's not about that. It's about how well can you convey what you've done and demonstrate that you've done it well. So keep that one in mind. Formula SAE, um, and I should have a slide on robot X, but I'm sorry I don't. Um, so there's probably something very similar about the two projects. Formula SAE is to make a market ready product. This is not about an individual project to design a motor controller or design a, um, a chassis or whatever else. It's a team project to make a market ready product and present it at the competition. It's no longer in Melbourne, but close enough. There might be 10 or 12, there might be 20. If we look at some of the really productive universities, um, they'll have 50 or 80 students on their term. Right? And it'll be expanding all years of the program. Seniors need the mentor juniors. Right? There's a range of people in here. Number one requirement, willingness to communicate, learn and do proactively. Funnily enough, if you put those three things in your resume, I'm willing to communicate, I'm willing to learn, and I do stuff proactively, your job prospects are probably going to go up. This is what people want from employees. Um, expect high peak workloads. Guess what? That's what work is. Um, it also depends on how well you manage it. You know, if you don't manage yourself and your team, you end up with a great deal of work to do in one big lump. If you sit down and talk about it in a team and work it out how it's all going to lay out, not so much. There can be some significant rewards from doing this or robot eggs, right? Um, both in, in personal satisfaction uh, as well as what you learn and take away from it. But again, if, if you really hate design and you're not a team or you're not a communicative person, I don't think anybody really knows what it is to be a team person until you've been a team person. Um, whilst you've done some group work, it's a little bit different than team work. Um, so, so think about it, but, but it's not for everybody. Absolutely. 2020, we've got the EV2 entry. And I'm sure if you want, if you're interested to contact me, I'll point you to the right people. Uh, and you can go and have a look at the EV2 down in the, uh, one of our buildings and see whether it does look like it's your sort of thing. So that is the end of my slides. Um, but I'm hoping that everybody will be able to take this information, process it, um, and make a better informed guess about the final year project. Um, the caveat for 2020 is that the lectures will be delivered as asynchronous on an asynchronous model. Um, which means that there'll be no set lecture time. I will post the material online and you'll basically work with your supervisor. But more of that will come clear when you enroll in the course. So I will leave it there.